तक रहिए Namaste and welcome to Indian Diplomacy, a show about India's foreign policy, India's engagement with uh, key strategic partners around the world, India's involvement in solving global problems, India's contributions to the emerging world order. Viewers, uh, in this episode, we are looking at India's involvement in the United Nations. The United Nations is the world's most universal multilateral organization. Uh, with 193 members, India of course being uh, one of the pillars of the UN as it has evolved in the last uh, 75 odd years. Uh, so India's contributions to the UN, what uh, are the major challenges before the UN, how India is trying to come up with solutions to them, as well as the politics at the UN which is uh, hampering its reform and progress. This is what we are going to be looking at and uh, I am really privileged to introduce you um, to my guest in the studio, uh, Ambassador Manjeev Singh Puri. Ambassador Puri uh, is a distinguished um, retired Indian diplomat uh, who has been India's ambassador to Nepal and also was Deputy Permanent Representative of India at the United Nations. Uh, so it is a great uh, honor for us to have him uh, with us today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Ambassador Puri, uh, when we talk about um, India and the UN, the thing that comes to mind the most is we were a founding member, 1945, even before India became independent. And the kind of ethos and civilizational values we have carried um, to the UN has made a huge difference. And there is almost a match between the core UN values and India's own uh, philosophy and approach to foreign relations, right? We have coexistence, international cooperation, multilateralism. No, uh, peace and economic development, all the core themes of the UN uh, in many ways match our values and I think that is one reason why we can say uh, with a lot of proof that uh, India has been like a role model member state, right? always been constructive, always offering positive uh, inputs to make the UN better. So your thoughts on how this match India and the UN at the core values level has really taken us uh, this far. Professor Cholia, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much for telling your viewers up front that India was a charter member of the United Nations. I think not many people would know that two years back we celebrated a century of India's interaction with multilateralism. We were a founding member of the League of Nations too. Mm. Now you have mentioned various ways in which we portray our country but may I make another suggestion. The most famous one, Vasudeva Kutumbam, the world is one family and that is what binds us and multilateralism international governance. You know, I, I do not know how to say it, but the world when it created international governance in terms of bodies such as the League of Nations, then the United Nations, perhaps we were the one country even though we were a colony. It was understood even by our colonial rulers at that time that our societal impetus was such that we fitted the bill mm. and we have since then strived hard to be part of this particular thing. We were not grandfathered as one of the countries which you know contributed to polarity at the United Nations for a variety of reasons. We were a colony among other things but the fact is that we have our heart and soul with multilateralism and with the United Nations and the entire body of multilateralism as it exists today. And talk of multilateralism Ambassador Puri, uh, it is in crisis, there is no question about it. Uh, large groups are not able to reach consensus, there is a lot of infighting, there is you know extreme uh, resort to uh, foul play in international uh, conduct and uh, international law is being disregarded, rule of law is in, under threat and this is the time to reinforce uh, the uh, UN values, isn't it? And that is where India has been a consistent voice that uh, if we forget the core purpose and the responsibility of the UN to the people of the world, then you know we lose relevance and uh, we lose our ability to really keep the world order stable and secure. So, um, the threats to multilateralism and our call for reformed multilateralism is really the core re for us to be able to uh, say that we are actually upholding or carrying the UN on one of our shoulders. 
you are very right that today the world is fairly dysfunctional. In fact, the Secretary General said it in his opening remarks when the current UNGA session started. But you know, dysfunctionality has been noted in the world since 1945. Mm. The first 50 years of the Cold War, what would you say? None of us used the word dysfunction. We accepted it. The UN was in paralysis. Yeah, yeah we, had, we accepted that's the way. We are making this judgment call based on something that happened after the end of the Cold War War, when there was one predominant leader of the world. So basically, I think we all need to understand that that phase of one single leader is now being challenged. Mm. Now, of course, most countries would say it is being challenged by one country to our northern and eastern side. But the fact is that it is all of us, the developing world, which is now coming to the fore, and therefore the challenge to, let me say, the Western or the developed world's way of life, mm. after literally three to four hundred years post the Industrial Revolution, being challenged by those who were colonized, subjugated, you can use whatever expression, but a coming of age of the entire globe and that results in challenges. Yes, currently we have challenges in a part of the world which does not have these connotations. It's an established power going into a smaller country but part of another established power, the European setup. Mm. And we are seeing that the world is not able to find or rather the United Nations is not able to find a way forward. My own understanding is uh, when large players play, to use expressions which are in a sense used very often, that great powers do what great powers have to do, mm. well, they will continue to play the game. But it is for all of us to make the concerted effort to make them see that it is in their interest that not war but peace is what is waged. Absolutely. Rules-based order uh, is at stake and uh, nothing less than that and the cascading crisis we are seeing, the UN is really struggling but that's where India comes in and uh, viewers, I have a very interesting uh, uh, video uh, clip of uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi speaking at the 75th anniversary of the UN where he made some very critical remarks but also spoke about uh, India's vast contributions. This must be truly understood before we talk about reforms. So let's hear uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, on this matter. Adhyaksha Mahodai, jab hum majboot the, to dunia ko kabhi sataya nahi. Jab hum majboor the, to dunia par kabhi boj nahi bane. Adhyaksha Mahodai, जिस देश में हो रहे परिवर्तनों का प्रभाव दुनिया के बहुत बड़े हिस्से पर पड़ता है उस देश को आखिर कब तक इंतजार करना पड़ेगा अध्यक्ष महोदय संयुक्त राष्ट्र जिन आदर्शों के साथ स्थापित हुआ था और भारत की मूल दार्शनिक सोच बहुत मिलती जुलती है अलग नहीं है संयुक्त राष्ट्र के इसी हॉल में ये शब्द अनेकों बार गूंजा है वसुधैव कुटुंबकम हम पूरे विश्व को एक परिवार मानते हैं यह हमारी संस्कृति संस्कार और सोच का हिस्सा है संयुक्त राष्ट्र में भी भारत ने हमेशा विश्व कल्याण को ही प्राथमिकता दी है भारत वो देश है जिसने शांति की स्थापना के लिए लगभग 50 पीस कीपिंग मिशन में अपने जांबाज सैनिक भेजे भारत वो देश है जिसने शांति की स्थापना में सबसे ज्यादा अपने वीर सैनिकों को खोया है आज प्रत्येक भारतवासी संयुक्त राष्ट्र में अपने योगदान को देखते हुए संयुक्त राष्ट्र में अपनी व्यापक भूमिका भी देख रहा है 
Prime Minister of India viewers are talking about the you know expansive role that India has played in the development of the UN and in all its uh, various functions. Uh, Ambassador Puri, uh, no doubt our contributions are enormous uh, and uh, it is not just financial, it is so much more including we have uh, sacrificed uh, lives of our soldiers uh, in large numbers. So, um, when we think about India's contributions, peacekeeping, Prime Minister already mentioned that there is also economic development, there is environmental protection public health, you name it, almost all the major global governance issues, India has played a constructive role. And you were deputy PR um, in New York uh, some years ago and you have in many ways directed that uh, active in involvement in solving global problems. So, tell our audiences how we do this and what approach we go into it and also about these uh, individual areas where we have made uh, you know significant uh, contributions. So, whether it is today fashionable or not fashionable, the bringing together of the non-aligned movement, the bringing together of the group of 77, G77, which yeah. is today 132 countries which fight for the, the requirements and the imperatives of the global south in global economic negotiations, India has been a sterling player. You mentioned environmental protection, you mentioned health. Let me tell you, India has been in the forefront of the entire issue of growth, sustainability, mm. development. And it has been our endeavor that each of these things is fostered with a global inclusiveness, mm. that it is done with taking everyone together. Even now, Ambassador, you, these uh, issue areas you mentioned which uh, concern the global south, India is saying that these should not be neglected, right? I mean, food security, energy security, lack of uh, availability of fertilizers. I mean, this year has been really, really devastating in terms of all these socio-economic crises, financial collapses in many uh, indebted countries, the issue of uh, you know extreme weather events causing you know calamities in small uh, d uh, island nations uh, and landlocked countries. We've been always uh, you know been the mouthpiece in many ways for these the downtrodden right and that is really a leadership role that India has played admirably. You are absolutely right Professor Cholia. India feels part of the global south. In fact, we are part of the global south aren't we? And we even though we are a large country, we believe that this largeness is something that we need to use for everyone because we believe that there are benefits for us and there are benefits for everyone, indeed the entire world for that. You listed a large number of areas. Let me take the perhaps the one which is occupying the global center stage at the moment, which is the area of climate change. Mm. Do you really think we will be able to find solutions to carbonization, to the entire issue of, car of climate change if we do not act together and in consonance and in collaboration? Not at all, mm. because what one country does impacts the others. What the industrialized world has done for over 150 years, we are paying the price for it today in the developing world. Mm. Justice, the need for equitable action, each and every one of them requires the globe to act together. You mentioned the issue of fertilizers, food grains. Again, this takes us back to the imperative for multilateralism. In the current issues that we are facing, the shortages of food grains, do you really think that an answer or a way forward in the imbroglio between Russia and Ukraine for the export of Ukrainian food grains for the benefit of the entire world, much of it in the global south, would have been possible without the standing in the middle of the United Nations, the Secretary General's own presence and the fact that you have what people may not call an honest broker, but at least a relevant broker which can take things forward where there is a listen in to all sides, mm. but creative and constructive solutions for the betterment of humankind is the main objective. And the UN, of course, uh, has to do this. This is its mandate. Uh, Ambassador Puri, um, in terms of the technicalities, we are part of many small uh, working groups and we have lots of mechanisms in the UN, both in the General Assembly and uh, we are just finishing another uh, successful tenure as a uh, non-permanent member in the Security Council. Tell our audiences how we build coalitions uh, uh, you know, with like-minded countries. You already spoke about G77, there is L69, but all these and then there are smaller uh, you know, initiatives around issues. Uh, India always seems to be very proactive, right? I mean, we in that sense, we punch above our weight. Uh, we may be a middle power, but we seem to be convinced 
joining a lot of countries around us. What is the attraction of India for the international community uh, when they gather around us or uh, follow initiatives that we take up uh, for them? We have had convening power as far as the global south is concerned. Why? Because A, we have the size, B, we have the feelings which reflect the global south its needs and its imperatives. Mm. And so therefore, it's not just the non-aligned movement and the G77, the L69 are coming together of small groups. But you know, we have shown this ability to work together with other countries, even in other areas. Look at the group of four, mm -hmm. the G4 yeah. for Security Council reform. We have Brazil, which is like us, a large developing country, but we also have Germany and Japan, yeah. the two countries most developed in the world, but left out as a result of the outcomes of World War II. Mm. So India has this unique ability to be able to work across the board. Our membership of the G20, the fact that we will chair it next year, yeah. are absolutely sterling examples that we are the country which reflects contemporary realities, the changing world, but the good in the changing world. The good in the changing world, uh, says Ambassador Manjeev Puri, indeed India is seen as a non-threatening and as a benign rising power, uh, which actually uh, thinks about the collective well-being of the international community and that's why we've been so successful at the UN. Uh, viewers, uh, I want you to hear um, uh, India's external affairs minister, Dr. Subramaniam Jay Shankar, uh, at Columbia University in New York talking about India's bid for reform and for change uh, in the Security Council and uh, the way forward for it. Uh, let's hear that and continue. Uh, on the Security Council, uh, you know, I, I was serious when I said I'm working on it. <laughs> uh, it's obviously a very hard task because at the end of the day, if you say what is the definition of our global order. Uh, the P5, the permanent members, is a very crucial definition of what the global order is about. So it's a very fundamental, very uh, deep uh, uh, sort of transformation that we are seeking. We believe the transformation is overdue because this, you know, this was a, the UN is a product which was uh, devised uh, 80 years ago. Uh, and 80 years ago, by any standards of human creativity, is a long time ago. Uh, and uh, if you look, uh, the, you know, the number of countries, independent countries have quadrupled uh, in that period. And uh, you know the case, you know, the big parts of the world uh, which are left out. But if I were to, in a sense, go to Professor Panagaria's description of where India would be, by the, you know, within a few years, this will be the third largest economy in the world. It will be the most populous uh, society in the world. It is a country which to have such a country not there in the key global councils, I mean, obviously it's not good for us, but I would also urge it's not good for the global council uh, in question. And I do believe that with each passing year, I sense in the world a greater and greater support for India to be there, because we do command today the confidence and trust of very large parts of the world. I do not want to compare it with the current P5, but I, I would at least say a lot of countries uh, perhaps think that we speak for them uh, with a high degree of uh, empathy and uh, uh, accuracy. So viewers, uh, India's external affairs minister talking about how year after year, uh, cumulatively more and more countries are supporting India's uh, deserving uh, case to be a permanent member of the Security Council. Um, Ambassador Puri, this is of course the holy grail. Uh, we have been chasing it for decades mm. now and the process is stuck. Um, clearly we have the credentials, we have actually uh, through our own deeds shown that we are a role model member state of the UN. But then uh, there are these naysayers and uh, Dr. Jayashank was talking about how they, we will work hard on amassing more and more support. But the point is in every region, be it for the G4 countries as a whole, there are the ones who are trying to pull uh, uh, us in the uh, backward direction and not allow these uh, reform initiatives to succeed. There is the so-called Uniting for Consensus group and uh, or better known as a coffee club. Now these, um, in many ways, they have played spoil sport, they have delayed things, they have, you know, just kicking the can down the road and uh, visibly we are frustrated and so is the, the world as a whole because the world wants to see change. I think if you ask public opinion also internationally, 
G4 easily will get the votes for being probably the most deserving of all, right? But then the decision is not made by the people of the world, even though the UN is made in the name of the we, the people of the United Nations. So, um, reform politics, you know, how do we deal with it? I mean, we have to use statecraft. I hope we are working on trying to break down these obstacles and, uh, you know, win over people who are uh, trying to block change. And uh, your thoughts on how we do it? What is our diplomacy in the UN? Um, let me first say, and you use this word, that you know we are visibly frustrated and I think that's the right way of articulating matters. But frustrated you should never get in international relations. You should plug away at it. Mm. Because these are long haul games and let me tell you these are games that nations play. You mentioned the coffee club or the uniting for consensus. This is a group of 15, 20 middling countries. Mm. What is their problem? Their problem is a simple one. Why should you go ahead? and become part of the polarity in international governance and why should we be left behind? Mm. It includes countries which believe they are equal to us or equal to the other G4 countries. That's one set. But you know, frankly, and I want to be a little candid here, do you really think that this kind of reform would not have gone forward had the P5 moved a resolution for expansion of the Security Council in the permanent and non-permanent side? No. So this game is yeah. of a much more uh, serious order, it is perhaps the ultimate game and, that countries play. And Ambassador, we should, I think, name the names. Uh, uh, you know, China is probably the only country that is not endorsed uh, within the P5 our uh, permanent seat and they keep uh, you know tiptoeing around it and being ambiguous uh, or even being hostile. Uh, the other four uh, do support India's candidature. You mentioned China. Of course, they are opposed. Their reasoning is so simple and straightforward, one does not have to go into it. But you know, I am not very sure mm. if the rest of them are really for it. Because if the rest were for it, believe me, combined massive efforts could have resulted in a change. Mm. Remember how at the uh, uh, grouping dealing with uh, uh, India getting access to nuclear technologies, the resistance of China was overcome. Yes. So these things happen, but my own understanding is that India is not just slowly but quite rapidly reaching a point where even the most naysayers would find it beneficial to have India inside with them. Yeah. Of and course, the politics of this is such that you may not be able to get all that you want. Global negotiations usually mean you can't get everything that you want, mm -hmm. but can you get most of what you want? These are decisions that governments take, people take, yeah. negotiators should really be always given a band and not just one hard red line when it comes to these sort of matters. So you give and take and you reach some, uh, you get something if, if not everything you want. Yeah. But uh, Ambassador, on the question of other P5 members also not pushing, I mean the US has now suddenly this year started, you know, uh, advocating for reform and expansion because they have a problem with Russia's veto. But in the past they were not as enthusiastic as you said. So clearly there is this opportunism of the P5 and the charter itself, the way it's been written is that you need their consent for any expansion to happen, the unanimous consent. So clearly the very method of uh, uh, methods for change uh, written into the charter itself have to be probably overhauled because otherwise this, uh, you know, is permanently blocked, you know, in one way or the other. Well, uh, you know, the Charter of the United Nations was framed in this sort of a manner because the experiences with the League of Nations, which had a much more open-ended idea of who could stop things from going forward, mm. was found to be deficient. This is a system in which we have a possibility, a good possibility. It melds together multilateralism with a degree of polarity, multipolarity. Mm. It's this polarity which is important and which needs to be kept at multipolarity level because then you have a balancing even within the polarity. Multilateralism is important for universal participation so that there is de jure acceptance, not just de facto. There is an ownership mm. which devolves in terms of United Nations action. And that is very important. And for a country like India, which believes that the world is one big family, these are particularly important elements. Absolutely. Absolute. Ambassador Manjeev Puri, if you were talking about uh, polarity and uh, uh, you know the, the way uh, international relations are conducted, the power 
as well as representation. These two have to be balanced for uh, reform to go forward. Uh, Ambassador Puri, apart from just membership, we have also been advocating for a reform in the working methods and the you know approaches of the UN in all its uh, you know vast. Uh, terrain of issue areas uh, on which uh, they have uh, field based agencies and funds and uh, specialized arms and including even peacekeeping. Um, how do we come up with such reform ideas and how hard is the is it to reform just the bureaucracy and the working process of the UN which is not to do talk about representation at the top, but just the day to day functioning because many people believe it is over bureaucratized, is not responsive to people's needs anymore and India has been saying you know we need to transform the procedural aspect. There, uh, please tell the audiences how we do this. It has always been our belief that you need to be inclusive, you need to take the larger membership into account. But in reality, the most important decisions get taken in, a, in the small coterie, the P5, as was mm. mentioned by the External Affairs Minister. Mm. India's efforts always have been broad based all of this. Take the larger membership into account. I will give you one example, yeah. one that I was personally involved in the entire business of sustainable development goals. Yes. When the MDGs were formulated a good 15 years earlier, they were actually a result of good intentions but announced by the Secretary General of the UN. Mm. When it came to sustainable development goals 15 years later, we made a great push and we were supported by the non-aligned movement, the group of 77, all developing countries that these needed to be discussed in the General Assembly of the United Nations mm -hmm. and then approved. And look, we have a set of sustainable goals, development yeah. goals, 17 of them, goals which reflect what the world still needs, not what are the priorities only of the developed world as mm. was all possibility would have happened. Now you mentioned about uh, taking things forward. I would like to leave with you one or two thoughts about areas which I think India should do more. Mm -hmm. One of them is, you know, we have always uh, been there, championed the global south and the voice of the global south. But now that we have reached a point where we are becoming the th third, fourth largest economy in the world, mm. we need to start stepping up our contributions to the UN, the main budget itself, mm. and be more upfront about it. The mm. second thing is, let us be very clear that the United Nations, while it might ostensibly run on the writ of the General Assembly and the General Membership. In effect, it is the Secretariat which runs the thing. Mm. And we must start understanding that the United Nations is an intergovernmental body. It is not international government. We need to start following what the Western countries regularly do, mm. what the Chinese have learned to do, and what several others in the European world, etc. do, which is start placing our people at key, key positions, positions in the UN Secretary the General. They are the ones who mold thinking in the organization. And frankly, in time, that thinking becomes, let me put it like this, the international agreed position. Absolutely. So, uh, influence is gained through uh, administrative mechanisms as well. It can sound boring, but then the reality is day-to-day -day operational, uh, you know, at the level of uh, field and the field based and as well as the headquarter based uh, people who are manning these positions. Uh, we need to have more Indian representation there as well and not just in the um, Security Council at the top. So, viewers, um, the sum of this discussion is that uh, India has been a substantial player in the UN and in its uh, evolution and development. There is uh, without India as uh, our external affairs minister uh, just said, uh, the global councils themselves lose credibility and relevance. Uh, the point is uh, India. <laughs>